Hello, I'm Steph from I Drive a Classic and today I'm talking to you about the Triumph Toledo. It's one of those funny saloons that's been dubbed one of the most underrated of the 1970s and it's a very interesting car because in the world of classic cars going endlessly skywards and becoming really unaffordable for young drivers and for people new into the world of classics I've seen quite a few Toledos going for an affordable price. Now I know that some people seem to think affordable means kind of around that five six k mark but a lot of these are going for under two and a half thousand pounds. In fact this example was under fifteen hundred pounds. So what do you get for your money and why should you go for something like an affordable Triumph Toledo instead of continuing to save and save and save for something that's perhaps more desirable like your Fords or you know an 80s hot hatch. Well in today's video I'm not only going to tell you a little bit about the history of the Toledo, I'm going to talk to you about affordability, usability because I myself have a 1300 which predates this and the owner of this car is using it regularly. So let's discover together the Triumph Toledo and first of all I'm going to take you for a walk around the outside and talk to you a little bit about the history of the vehicle. 1970 saw Triumph, now part of British Leyland, step into a new era that people kind of said was a little bit more logical, where the saloons on offer made much more sense to the discerning buyer. So let's talk about what we had. You had the new Toledo, as we see in front of us, which came in as a bit of a middle point. So if you remember the Triumph Herald, it sat between that, which was, yep, still in production, and the soon to depart 1300. Now a lot of people think, because because you don't see many 1300s anymore, that they weren't a very good seller or they're a bit of a flop. But actually, even in 1970, when this came out, they were still churning out around 500 a week. So it was a very good seller for a car which, throughout its production life, didn't really have any changes. Now what was happening to the 1300? Well that was being replaced by the 1500 and then a couple of years later in 1972, to skip forward a little bit, the range then gets the Dolomite which we reviewed last year. Now whilst the Meteor 1500 sported a long stroke version of the 1300 engine that they'd seen in the front wheel drive car from the 60s, the Toledo used the 1300 engine straight out of the front wheel drive car and it was also in the Herald and a lot of people don't know this but I think it's the same engine also used in the Amphi car. So it's quite a well used engine which means that people tend to know a lot about it, it's quite handy. Now some might say why not develop a new engine it feels a bit lazy but if you look at a lot of 70s cars whether it's from Ford, British Leyland, overseas manufacturers, manufacturers took a general overall approach that if it was a perfectly adequate engine and they could carry it over let's do that and update the body styling instead. Plus Triumph would have said to you if you want more power come and have a look at the 1500 on the forecourt. Now this 1300 engine if you look at material from the time is said to deliver 58 brake horsepower but if you notice that's a little bit of a reduction from the 1300 front wheel drive because when you see it in marketing literature for that it's 61 brake horsepower and I'm going to tell you why that is that's because they put that down to a conversion to the DIN standard for power output all very geeky but I knew somebody would want to know why. Now interestingly Triumph saw the Toledo as the car with the potential not the 1500 which was more expensive. So what they did was they saw it as a unit to develop upon and bring brilliant new opportunities throughout the 70s and beyond. They saw it as a car that they were going to really carry on with. Now we talk a little bit about it in the car later on, but although you'll see few changes outwardly to the car, there are enormous changes underneath which were made to take it from that front 1300 front wheel drive design to the one which befitted the rear wheel drive functionality as we see on the Toledo. For example, the floor pan had to be completely rejigged to take the new propeller shaft and the live rear axle and there was also a large and deep front subframe. Now if you know anything about those 1500 front wheel drive cars it's also used that deep front subframe is also used on those too. Now all this investment and engineering prowess really does lend weight to the fact that Triumph thought this, this one was the car that they were definitely going to do a lot more with. 
Now as the 1500, you're probably wondering what they thought they were going to do with that. Now even though it's not the subject of this video, it's worth mentioning that Triumph saw that being the new 1300 in that it was just going to kind of stay as is, so you might have a TC, but really they weren't going to muck about with it too much. Now today, a fair few of these Triumph saloons survive. They're hardy, they're useful, and every owner, I think, will probably tell you that they're very practical. But who owns a car like this, and why would you keep buying these Triumph saloons? Well, I'm going to hand over to Kev. He's a channel regular, someone who got me into Triumphs, and got my love going and hopefully he'll get your love going too. He's owned 1300s, 1500s, Toledo's, Dolomites. If it's got a Triumph badge on it, he's probably owned it. But why? Well, Kev, it's over to you. Hi, Kevin Hurst here, star, star of stage, screen and um, various dole queues up and down the country. This is my 1972, Happy New Year by the way, 2023 is going to be a great year. Uh, this is my 1972 Triumph Toledo, bought fairly locally from Facebook Marketplace, relatively cheaply as Steph discussed before. Bought it specifically for filming, which it has already uh, done a bit of filming, which is quite quite nice done various bits and pieces to it ball joints etc all the things that you need to keep it going touch wood it's going to be a good it's going to be a good car i've got a good feeling about it having said that it'll probably break down on the way home we'll have to push it but um we all love a triumph we all love our classic cars it is a strange bizarre illness but you meet some fantastic people and it's a great entry level into classic cars people ask me about it they're interested in it and it's just a nice feel-good car it's a very good original car and I would like to know the history of it if anybody knows the history of it it's been a Liverpool car so it's been fairly local and spent a lot of time in Chester it's only three owners but I can tell some mechanic some old boy has really looked after this thing it's all been well taken care of and and it's nice to put it back on the road again. One of the things that grabs me every time that I get into this Toledo compared to my 1300 is it's jolly simple inside. Now when Triumph went out with their marketing message around the Toledo and they said oh you know it's cheaper than the 1300 and by this point the 1300 was coming to the end of its production life I think they'd sold 130,000 of them but this came in and it came in cheaper than the 1300 and slightly more expensive than the Herald which was still in production. Now if you're going to say to me Steph gosh the Herald 1360 must have been really wheezy by that point it must have been very old in long in the tooth it was but it had a key hook for Triumph because it was so cheap and I think it was a hundred pounds cheaper than the Toledo. It was a really good entry car for people looking to get into Triumph. And I think it's something that brands could learn a lot from nowadays is if you do create that loss leader or that budget product, that bottom ranger, it locks people into a brand and a love of a brand and the world of aftermarket servicing, etc. that Perhaps people tend to look at, overlook nowadays because I feel like every car is so expensive. So I think these were £988 when they came to market. And for me, yes, it was cheaper than 1300 but at what cost? Because I think they talked an awful lot about things like um, the fact that it was rear wheel drive. And they said that they did that because they felt people were more comfortable with that because from a traditionalist standpoint and also because it was cheaper. So if you look at this and you look at 1300 shell wise, you might think, oh, they look relatively the same. Most of the changes are, of course, on that front grille. You'll notice a lot around there. But you'll also notice a lot of changes underneath to accommodate that rear wheel drive functionality to accommodate that live rear axle and of course when you come inside you notice things like this change I think this section here is from the Vitesse um, and I think it's the same somebody told me it's the same gearbox as this in the marina or very similar setup to it but for me the thing that you lose from the 1300 because the 1300s and I say this is the driver are a little bit fussy with that front wheel drive and you've got that input shaft and this is a lot more traditional a lot more people are used to is you lose some of that beauty and some of those delicate features you look at the door handles on this and the wind down windows and 
the door handle, the, the window winders on the 1300 were that safety design that popped back into the actual door. Um, that's gone now. We're on to just a conventional window winder to save money coming in front of us. So much of what we had on that dash before is gone. And we had that lovely all systems go wheel where you had all sorts on there, low fuel lights. Um, I'm trying to think what else. It warns you about a lot more on there than you get on here. So when we come into this, it's all very simple. So your heater controls are in center. They're very simply laid out. Coming in front of us here, we have just essentially two dials and that's everything that you've got. You've got a temperature gauge, you've got a fuel gauge, you've got your indicator light, indicator warning lights. And over on the right hand side there, you've just got your simple speedo and you've got three lights beneath that for your beam, your oil and your ignition. So things like, um, we have a trip clock and all of that. All of that's gone. They've stripped all of that out to save money. And the one thing that I will say is, is a wooden dash does feel a lot more reassuring than that plastic that you've got in the 1300 because it's like a plastic inset here, which has cracked because you've got your window washers, which sit up here in the 1300. And mine are cracked and I've seen quite a few others that are cracked so perhaps that's a design weakness that's developed over time but here you've got this lovely wooden dash and you've got everything set into it which feels a lot more sturdy but I think it's missing some of that design beauty that you had on the 1300 and for those of you that haven't seen it I have done a video of the 1300 and you can watch it and see it in a little bit more detail to see what I'm referring to. So yeah, we've, we are missing a few bits, but reassuringly, it still all feels very Triumph. The layout is pretty much the same inside. Your seating position doesn't feel too different. We're missing a couple of bits like the fold down armrest in the back that was such a nice detail. But one thing this car has got that perhaps you've not seen on a Toledo before is this sunroof. And now this is a Webasto sunroof, uh, well, sunshine roof, and it was fitted after the car was purchased. So I've had a look at the, um, the heritage certificates that you get from the British Motor Museum, and this isn't listed as one of the optional extras. However, one of the things that is listed is that it has been fitted with disc brakes. Now, I'm not too sure if by this point in production, disc brakes were standard, but when they issued these, these... Uh, time of launch they were only issued with drum brakes which is in my opinion strip out what you want from a design feature strip out those fancy window winders but why on earth have you gone from the 1300 with disc brakes to a car now issued with drum brakes for me that's compromising safety somewhat so I don't think that perhaps that's one of the greatest things that Triumph did when they created the Toledo but that's enough of my waffle and talking about what we've got inside here let's start the car up now one of the things that I recently talked about in a piece in Practical Classics was the pitfalls of repro parts and the quality that they're made to because I think that some of the quality is just not there anymore and this has recently had <laughs> a new key barrel fitted. Now it's not working every time so we're having to jiggle it around. So what I'm going to do is start the car up for you but should it not start what we'll do is we'll just cut the video and we'll keep going until we get it for you. So fingers crossed. It won't start, will it? Let's have a look. Check with neutral. No, this is what I mean. Ah. Don't worry, she was warm. I wouldn't be revving a cold car. Now that all sounds refreshingly familiar because of course I'm so used to that engine in my 1300. If you're wondering what it sounds like from the outside, let's flip the camera around, I'll let you have a listen and then we're going to go out for a drive. was made in the West Midlands I 
think it's far more used and enjoyed on these back roads of West Yorkshire. Now, I hope you can see there's a lot of fun to be had on four wheels because people seem to think that because it's got that 1300 engine in that was out of the Herald, I think people sometimes expect a wheezy old bird that isn't really up to much. But actually, once you get these out, you find that they're just as fun and just as zippy and full of energy as their cousin, the Dolomite. Well, it's not as fast as a Dolomite, but it's just as fun. As we come down, it's as you'd expect, it's got that rack and pinion steering. Now the ball joints have all been redone on the front of this, so the steering is very light and feels very responsive. And it's made me think that perhaps I need to have a look at my steering because this is far more light than you'd perhaps expect. Now I think a lot of people look at cars like this and they fall into two camps. They're either, oh, it's a car that can only be used sparingly, or they seem to think that it's going to be something archaic where you can't get the parts. So I wanted to talk to you about this and dispel some of the myths. Now, first of all, the great thing about this car is, is that unlike a lot of cars from the 60s, where you get in stuff like stuff that was really widely sold, things like the Anglia, the Morris Minor, and you find that you haven't got synchro on first gear. And I think for a younger driver, or perhaps someone that's not a dyed in the wool classic aficionado, that can feel a little bit daunting because you think, oh God, you know, it's all the world of double D clutching and all that nonsense. Whereas you're getting something like this, and it's a far more modern experience. You've got synchro on all four gears. You've got that traditional rack and pinion steering that I think everybody knows enough about. And it's a decidedly easy car to drive. Now, one of the things that I will say is, is a lot of people critique the very large turning circle of the 1300, which came in at 34 feet. This on advertising literature from the time comes in exactly the same. 34 feet, despite the fact that it is a rear wheel drive. Now, you can read whatever you want, marketing and PR spiel from the time, when people say, oh, you can get a top speed of this or that. Now, I'll tell you what I can get in my 1300, because with it being the same engine as this, you probably can get the same sort of top speed out of this. Now, I've had it comfortably sitting at 75 miles per hour without having to thrash it. So I'd imagine you can get something similar out of this, which opens up a world of opportunity because it means you can take it out onto a motorway. So a lot of people think that classics, oh God, you've got to use it sparingly, you can't use it on the motorway. Not so, you can definitely keep up with modern traffic and it's not hard to do so either in one of these. It's a very usable car. And with that usability, let's talk about parts availability because I think that's something that people worry about, quite rightly so, because some cars from the 50s, you can't even get a head gasket for. Now, when you get into a Toledo or a Dolomite 1300, 1500, even the Herald, there's a lot of shared parts. There's a lot that's shared across the range, especially with that shared engine being used in 1300, the Herald and this. Um, so you can get everything you need. You can go to Rumor Brothers. You can order it through someone like Fitchett's Moss. Essentially, if you come a cropper with a problem, you can probably get the part within a few days, which means that it's something that you can use and enjoy and you don't have to worry about the next breakdown. I mean, I was talking to someone not too long ago. What did they have? They had a Zodiac and they said to me, they went, was it Zephyr or Zodiac? I think it was a Zephyr actually. And he said to me, he said, I can't even just go out there and enjoy it and use it on the regular because I know that parts are so scarce that I'm just waiting for the next breakdown. And that's the great thing with one of these is, is that you can go out there and use and enjoy it. And if you're worried about panels, you don't need to worry too much because most of what you need is out there and it's readily available. Now I hope you can see as we come up this hill with great gusto, that whilst it's quite noisy inside the cabin, we are managing to get up the hill without too much stress in our hands might have to drop into first gear actually it's a it's a steeper hill than uh, 
it's a steeper hill than I anticipated, but that's on me as the driver. And I've got a passenger in the back as well. Now hopefully, if you've watched this video and you've been in sort of two minds about what sort of classic to get, and you, like me, have got a very small budget, hopefully I've opened your eyes to the world that these old Triumph saloons can offer. They're great because you can get parts that you need, you've got a fantastic community, the Triumph Dolomite Club, a world of absolute stars. I mean, they've, in the last year, reproduced obsolete parts, there's support out there, anything that you want to know, somebody in the club will give you a helping hand or chat to you about. So the camaraderie is there, the parts are there, the cars are relatively cheap to buy into, and also, clubs as well like it because you don't just have to join one club and stick with it you've got club triumph the tr register all of these clubs got on fantastic events they've got brilliant communities and triumph really is a brand for me where you can buy into it you're going to meet some great people and have a really great time because as well as enjoy the car this is the fun aspect as well especially now that we can get out and start enjoying car shows again so if you're looking and you're looking for yourself or a younger person start looking at some of these triumph saloons they are fantastic now that's it from me today it's our first video of 2023 i hope you've enjoyed it i've enjoyed making it and of course i got to feature one of my very dear friends who i love to bits so until next sunday when we're looking at something else take care and drive safely mm -hmm.